Good evening, everyone. How y'all liking the weather? Winter on Monday, summer on Tuesday, spring on Wednesday. <laughs> Back to winter on Thursday because we was freezing. Praise the Lord. All right. Are we ready to praise the Lord? All right. That's good to hear. Will everyone please stand? What hope we hold this starlit night? A king is born in Bethlehem. Our journey long, we seek the light that leads to the hallowed manger on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet their songs repeat Of peace on earth goodwill to men And the bells are ringing Like a choir they're singing In my heart I hear them Peace on earth Goodwill to men And in despair 
despair I bowed my head There is no peace on earth I said For hate is strong and mocks the song A peace on earth good will to men But the bills are bringing Welcome back this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you again for uh, this opportunity, uh, the opportunity to come in and uh, worship you, Yad Most High. Lord, we pray that, again, we would be continually doing that this, this Christmas season. We'd be pouring out our praise for you every single day, Lord. And, uh, not just while we're in these places, not just while in these settings, but again, every day, everywhere we go. Lord, bless this service in a mighty way. Bless this offering uh, like only you can, Lord. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Will everyone please stand?
Amen. It's good to see you all this evening. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Psalm 88. So a couple of reminders this week. Our holiday dinner is Wednesday. And um, if you haven't signed up already on the Welcome Center, please sign up. Um, I think it helps the deacons <laughs> uh, for you to sign up. Uh, they always add more. That's why I said that. So, uh, but we do need you to sign up. That way they know how much more to add um, to, the, to the list. So uh, please do that. And then, again, Thursday is our last outreach for the last couple weeks. Um, and uh, don't forget, um, we have child care and we provide a meal. And so we ask you to uh, join us there if you can. And then our Christmas play is next Sunday evening. Um, so uh, invite, invite, invite. Amen. Psalm 88, let's pray and we'll jump into this. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, the opportunity we've had again tonight to worship you. Uh, to rejoice in what you've done for us in sending your son uh, to be born of a virgin, Lord, to live a sinless life and die on the cross, make atonement for our sins, God, to be risen again, and uh, Lord, that we could have life eternal uh, through you, through you alone. And God, we, we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for this time now to open your word. I pray that as uh, we go through this, God, that you would speak to us, that we would respond rightly uh, in a way that's pleasing to you. And God, just have your way now. And I pray that you just use me as a vessel uh, to speak what needs to be spoken, and we'll praise you for that. Lord, we ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 88, verse 1. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. Now, first of all, I don't know if any of you here have been there, uh, but if you have, you know how miserable uh, the psalmist is and maybe you're there right now maybe you are in a place where you are crying to God day and night and um, you're just just withering away uh, whether it's emotionally uh, mentally uh, maybe even spiritually uh, but you you you've been there again you're, you're there uh, but obviously with the psalmist there's a problem he's dealing with something that has completely consumed him and he's brought him to a place where he's crying unto God day and night um, again, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know I've been there. I know I've, I, I, um, I've seen other people. Many people have gone through the same exact thing uh, where uh, they're dealing with something that they're in despair about. Uh, they're dealing with something that's way too heavy for them. Um, so many different, uh, again, aspects that we can deal with this uh, in our life. But again, it's a petition to God for this hurt, for this situation that he's in. And, and I want us to remember this, that no matter where we're at, no matter how long we've been going through it, God knows what we're going through. Um, and again, we, we've said that many times before, but uh, that's not to be taken lightly. Um, God knows the, the mental anguish that you're going through. He knows the emotional uh, struggles that you're having. He knows everything that's going on in your life, and, and um, He cares. Um, the Bible says that. In 1 Peter, it says, cast all your care upon Him. For he careth for you. God cares for you. God cares for us. Again, he demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So again, we don't have to question God's love. We don't have to wonder, does he care? Does he, uh, does he even uh, care enough to do something about uh, what I'm going through right now? And again, that's where the psalmist was. Um, I want to say this too. Our affliction, the struggles that we have in this life, don't necessarily make God happy in the fact that we're suffering. Our affliction, only as it pleases God, only as it brings glory to Him, or as it will bring glory to Him, uh, will please God. That's the only thing about our affliction that God is pleased with. Um, did it please the Father to bruise the Son? Uh, yes, it did. The Bible says so. Only in that, though, it was going to bring about the glory that God was due but also the purposes that God desired. And again, so uh, if we consider what we're going through in our lives and the struggles that we have, the afflictions that we're going through, and we say, is God pleased with this? Is God happy with this? Is God okay with the struggle that I'm going through? Number one, he doesn't, he doesn't like it, just like I don't like to see my girls hurting or struggling or going through something. He doesn't like it in the sense that the pain that we're dealing with, but he's pleased with 
what might be produced through that affliction. And again, that's how it pleased the Father to bruise the Son. That's what Isaiah chapter 53 says. I'm going to read those scriptures. It says this in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant be justified shall uh, servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities therefore will i divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors again god was not happy in that uh his only begotten son was suffering on the cross in the pain that he was going through however it did please him to bruise him for the purpose that he intended him uh, to suffer, which was for transgressors, to make intercession for transgressors. Not only that, to bring glory to his name. And so again, when we look at our lives, and, and again, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, uh, the afflictions that we go through in our lives, we say, man, why am I going through this? Does God not care? Does God not care enough to, I mean, if God has that power to instantly just cure me, to instantly help me, to instantly heal me, to instantly uh, deliver me from this struggle, why doesn't he do that? It would be the same question asking, well, why did God have to send Jesus to the cross? Why did, why, why did he have to die that death? Why did he have to shed his blood? Because that was the only way. And just like in our lives, sometimes the only way we can get to that place where our lives bring glory to God in the way that he wants us to is through those trials and afflictions, through those things sometimes we don't understand. Um, again, we, we've looked at that recently in, in some messages, uh, but we have to trust God um, that if it was as easy as just saying, you're done with that, I'm going to deliver your family from this, you're, 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 you're out of that situation. If it was easy as that, and that's all it was, I believe because of God's love for us, he... He answers it just like that. But when we, are, we last in those trials and we continue on in that, that despair and we, we, we continue on in agony, we have to know, we have to know that God has a purpose in this. And remember the Apostle Paul. The Bible says that, the, that Satan sent a messenger uh, to buffet him in the flesh, lest he be exalted above measure. Um, Paul, you know, seen the, the third heaven, many visions and dreams and, and uh, many things that he could boast about, but the Bible says that God sent... Uh, this thorn in the flesh uh, to keep him humble. And the Bible says he asked God three times to deliver him from that. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Again, now there's no way that I could ever touch the Apostle Paul, the work that he did, the things that God did through his life. I don't know that anybody in here could. I mean, I think there's a lot uh, of great Christians in here that have done amazing things and will continue to do amazing things. Uh, but I don't know that any of us will ever touch the Apostle Paul. That's just my opinion. I'm not, I'll get to heaven, and maybe there's somebody in here that will far surpass the Apostle Paul. But we look at the volume of his work and the things that God did, the majority of the New Testament being penned by him. Again, we look at this and say, man, what greater servant of God has there been in all of uh, church history than the Apostle Paul? Some may argue, well, there were other men throughout church history. Uh, you, you know, you had uh, all the, uh, the people that were... Um, and the antagonist and uh, the polemist and, and, and all those people. You had th those, those people that were doing uh, these amazing works throughout church history. But again, I don't, I don't know that there's anybody that, that holds a candle to the Apostle Paul. Yet God allowed this to happen in his servant's life. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And the reason I'm sharing this tonight is because sometimes I think we look at our afflictions um, and we don't embrace them as maybe something God uh, is doing. And the reason why we don't embrace them like that is because they're painful, because they're not fun, they're not enjoyable. Um, if we it, it could go through the afflictions and the struggles and the trials, um, and we could have the same feeling as when we experience great blessings by the hand of God, then we would be all over the place. Yeah, bring the afflictions on, bring the trials, bring the hurt, bring the pain. Uh, but that's not the way it is. And so our response can be, um, the way that I think God uh, is pleased with. Uh, or it can be in a completely negative way and miss the point of it all. Um, but again, no matter what, 
no matter where our journey takes us, no matter what affliction we're facing, no matter what, our lives are journeys of faith. To just simply trust God, trust Him no matter what we go through, no matter what we're dealing with. Again, the psalmist was dealing with something very great, very heavy, something, uh, something beyond his own strength, something uh, where he felt like he was at the end of his life. And again, I don't know, maybe you've been there before. Maybe you felt like this is the end. I, I, I can't take anymore. I, I've come to the end of my everything. Um, that's where the psalmist was. That's, that's where he was, and that's what his, now he is crying out to God at that place. Again, that's an important note as well. Um, so many times when we come to the end of our rope, if you will, we come to the end of our struggle, we try to find those answers in ourselves or in other people or in other things. The psalmist, even though he was at the end of his rope, he's turning to God. He's crying out to the Lord. But he continues in verse 3 and he says this, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. Again, I feel like I'm the end of my rope. My, full, my, my soul is full of troubles. I don't have any more life. I feel like I'm at the end of my life. I'm counted with them that go down into the pit or the grave. I'm as a man that hath no strength. Again, maybe you're there tonight, but if you've been a Christian for a while, chances are you've been at least close to this before. Um, and, and that's not a fun place to be, where you feel like you are completely weak. You're without strength. And that's what he's saying. I'm there. He said, I'm there. I feel like the grave is ready for me. I feel like I'm literally laying next to the grave, that my life is over. I have no more strength. I'm dealing with this struggle. I'm dealing with this affliction. And basically, it's just a, a, a matter of either someone or time and me falling into the grave. I'm, I'm right there, he's saying. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they're cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Again, this, the troubles of his life, the waves, uh, maybe of God's wrath, or the troubles that have come over his soul, over his entire being, have completely consumed, consumed him. And he was seeing his life as done. His life dead. No purpose, no more life. No, no more days saw himself as dead and God having no more desire for him. And that is a difficult place to be. God's done with me. I don't know that God can use me anymore. That's a difficult place to be. And again, that's where he fell. This, this, this man, this psalmist writing... God, the where I'm at right now, I feel like you've completely written me off. I feel like you're completely done with my life. And you say, man, I've never been there before, and I hope I never get there. And that's a good desire. Uh, but chances are you'll get somewhere close to that. Somewhere in your life at some point in time. And he was so far away that he says this to God. God, you put me here. You gave this to me. You, you have put me in this condition. You've, you've laid me in the lowest pit. You've, you've, you've cast me aside. You, you have been, you, you've basically written me off. And your wrath is heavy upon me like waves. It's overwhelmed me. Notice also what he was going through. He says this, Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and cannot come forth. The grief and the pain and the struggle and the misery that he was in had separated him from all of his friends. And he was, so he was hurting, but not only was he hurting, he was alone. And that's one of the toughest things about this place as well. Um, if you've been there or you're there now, you know that is what it's like. No matter what anybody says, no matter how many people may actually be around you, you feel completely isolated and alone. You feel like you're just out there all by yourself, forsaken, no friends, no nothing. And now, I'll say a couple things about that. Number one, sometimes we come to these places in our lives because of the decisions that we've made, whether they be sin or whether it be walking away from God um, in, in a backslidden state, which is, of course, sin as well. Um, but sometimes it's just the circumstances that overwhelm our life. Uh, either way, this place is a miserable place to be when you're all alone, feeling isolated, 
not only from God, feeling cold and separated from God, but also from every, everybody who's supposed to be your friend, everybody who's supposed to be close to you. And again, that's what he was feeling. That's, that's why he was so desperate uh, for God to intervene. But I think it even goes deeper than that. I think it goes deeper than just the fact that he didn't feel like he had any friends anymore, that he was laying in the grave, that God's wrath, the waves of God's wrath had overtaken him, that God was done with him, God was finished with him, uh, that he couldn't deal with this pain. I think, I think there was a, a, a desperation for God to intervene that was deeper than all of the, the things that were going on in his life. And, and some people may disagree with this, but as you, you read the next few verses, it kind of surfaces. Look what it says in verse 9. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. Again, he mentions this again. I've called out to you daily, God. I'm crying out to you. I've stressed out my hands unto you. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shalt the dead arise and praise thee? Said a lot. He says, think about that. Pause for a second and think about this. Can the dead praise you? Can, the, can, can, can those that are in the grave offer unto you what you're worthy of? And again, I, I, the answer, of course, is no, but that's where he was. He was feeling like my life, I, all of these afflictions, all this struggle, these things that I'm going through, I can't even praise you. I, and, and so if, if my life is over, if you're done with me, then I can, these lips, this, the, this, this breath can no longer give to you praise that you're worthy of. And a dead man praised God. Look further as he goes on in verse 11. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? What was that, that deeper desperation for God to deliver, deliver him? I believe that he desired to be rescued so that he could declare God's goodness and God's praise. Now, maybe his afflictions drew him to that place, but it did pull it out of him. And I say that because I think so many times we, we miss the whole um, privilege and amazing blessing of being able to praise God with these bodies and with these lips. You know, too often I think we go through the motions, whether it be in a song service like we just had, or whether it's just the daily praising of God. Jesus said, look, don't, don't forbid them because if... if if they don't, the rocks will cry out. I mean, he, he can cause the stones to pray. All of creation is supposed to praise his name. It's supposed to bring him glory. And his prizes creation, mankind, us, should be at the very top and the very foremost of praising his name. But you look at the very stars and you look at, look at all of nature, and the Bible says that it praises his name. I mean, they, they, were, they, they, they display his handiwork. They resound his praise. But we should, there shouldn't even be a competition in our life with the praise that we give to God, no matter what. The afflictions that this psalmist went through brought him to the place where he realized how important it was to praise the Lord. Not, again, not just rehearse it, not just to go through the motions, not just to go through uh, the, the, this process. But he says, listen, if I'm dead, I can't praise you. If I'm in the grave, I can't talk about your, love, your long suffering and your, your loving kindness. I can't do the things that you're so worthy of me to do. He, he was brought to that place. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to get to that place. And I don't want to have to get to that place to realize how amazingly blessed and fortunate we are to have this opportunity to, to praise the Lord. You know, we, we've had discussions before about, um, I think Brother Jeffrey mentioned something about it this morning whenever he was uh, praying or just the introduction, um, but about praising the Lord one day, being in his presence and, and worshiping him. And, um, you know, I, I've said this, I, the Bible says eternal life, that one day we're going to have life and it's eternal. There's going to be things and responsibilities that we have. It won't necessarily be watching the Cowboys. It won't necessarily be, um, you know, going out and hunting or playing golf or anything like that. But we're going to have a life there with God the way that God intended and designed it in the very beginning. That's what I believe. Again, Jesus Christ reconciled that. Um, and so that's where I think we're going. It's going to be a life. But I've, I've, I've been asked, are we going to just be in God's presence? I mean, around his throne, praising his name 
for all of eternity? Is that what heaven is going to be like? I've answered some people like this before. That would be way better than spending eternity in a burning lake of fire. I mean, I would rather, if, if that's what all heaven was going to be, again, that's in a human, fleshly, sinful mindset. If, if all we're going to do is sit around the throne of God and worship him, I think I'm going to get bored. That's a fleshly mindset right there, being bored anyways. We're just going to stand around the throne and worship all the time. And again, I've said before, it, if that's what we did, I promise you this, we would be completely satisfied with that. Because we won't have the tainted minds and the tainted bodies, and we won't have the, the flesh to deal with. We won't have all those things that we're dealing with. We are going to be reunited with our Creator, God of all creation, in His presence, all power, all might, all glory, and we are going to be in awe, in awe. And it's not like the awe that you see whenever you get a new gift at Christmas, and you're just like, you know, awe, and then it goes away because the gift eventually I mean, it, it, it's not new anymore. Not like that. It is a completely held captive all for all of eternity. And so I think that if we were to stand around the throne of God and worship Him for all of eternity, forevermore, I think that it, we would be completely satisfied with that. I think that we would be, we wouldn't know any less or, or any more. We would, we would be completely satisfied in the presence of God simply in being in awe of Him and worshiping Him. But again, I think there is going to be life. I think there's going to be things that we're doing aside from bringing praise and glory to his throne. Um, but I say that because we have this opportunity now to praise him for who he is and what he's done. We have this opportunity with these lips that, that do know sin, with this mind and this body that does know sin, just like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7. I mean, just... just you know, the struggle, I, this, this struggle that I have with this body of death, the sin and death that uh, obeys that law of sin and uh, the inner man obeys the law of Christ. But we have this opportunity in these bodies to praise God, to worship Him. Get up in the morning, praise Him. Throughout the day, praise Him. At night, praise Him. Gather with His saints to praise Him. We have this amazing privilege. And again, I don't want us to miss the, the amazing blessings in all of this. I've been guilty of in my life going through the motions. And it, and it feels bad when you, when you realize that and then you admit that. I've been guilty of going through the motions when I could have been completely engaged in praising the God of all creation, my Lord, my Savior, the one that laid down his life who didn't have to. He's glorious, God Almighty. And he did these things for me and I have the opportunity with saints, by myself, all the time to praise my Creator. And I don't want to be brought to a place of absolute desperation and despair to be reminded about how important and fortunate I am to praise Him. And that's what the psalmist had come to a place. So listen to my life. I feel like my life's over. I'm weighted down with all, all of this, uh, the, your wrath. I, I, I'm dealing with all these afflictions. And I feel like I'm about to die. God, remember, if I'm dead, I can't praise you. And that's what my desire is. I want to praise you, God. I can't talk about your loving kindness and your long suffering. If I'm dead, so God, please help me. Please help me. So he wondered in his despair in verse 13, I've cried uh, unto thee, unto thee I've cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou face from me? Why am I still dealing with this if this is my desire? Don't raise your hand, but have you ever asked the Lord that before? God, I just want to serve you. God, I just want to praise you. God, I, I want to be effective for you or whatever the, the desire has been. And yet you're still dealing with the struggle. You're still dealing with the weight. You're still dealing with the pain. You're still dealing with the affliction. You're still de dealing with the things that you're dealing with. And you ask that, God, why am I still dealing with this if these are my desires? If this is what I want to do for you and it's right and it's according to your will and it's according to your word, then why am I still dealing with this? Why are we still dealing with this? Why is this still an issue in my life, why is this still an issue in our life? But look as he goes on in this, verse 15. I'm afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They come round about me. They came round about me daily like water. They come past me about 
t- uh, together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. That's a place of misery. A miserable place. And, and again, maybe you've never been there before. So I, I've never been there in my Christian life. You talk about most people have. I, I've never been there before. I've never been to where I felt like I didn't have a friend. I, I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have uh, anything but all affliction pouring over me all the time. When I got up, when I went to bed, all the time, misery, misery, misery. I've never been there before. Praise God. Praise God if you haven't been there before. But look what he does for the third time. He cried unto the Lord, affirming his faith in this cry to God for help. But right after that, he begins to question the Lord why he had apparently rejected him, why he had kind of cast him off, and he states again that his afflictions were miserable and terrible. Like Job in some ways, the psalmist was suffering under what appeared to be God's wrath, separated from friends, from his relationships, loved ones, in complete despair. But here's the deal. No matter how low and how bad he was, he was still crying out to God. He was still seeing God as his only source of hope. His only help at this very bottom of the bucket. He continued to pray. He continued to call out to God. And that's what I want to share and encourage you with tonight. No matter how dark, no matter how deep, no matter how bad or how lonely or how hard things get or how hard things are, keep praying and keep turning to God. So I've been doing that for years. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Don't stop. Don't, don't give up. So I've been praying for this for five years and nothing has changed. I still deal with this health issue. I still deal with this emotional issue. I still deal with this mental. I still deal with this spiritual struggle. I'm still dealing with these things. And I call out to God every day. And it seems like nothing changes. What I'm telling you tonight, based on this, keep praying and keep turning to God. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't quit. Keep calling on God. Because there may just be the blessing right around the corner. So I don't see that. It's been five years, and how am I going to believe that it's going to be right around the corner? You know, in the the time in ministry, it's it's a challenging uh, dilemma you face sometimes. Decisions that you make, um, calls that you make uh, about people and ministry and and the church, and even in your own life. And and you you, you face the, the question, well, what if I move too quick? Or what if I wait too long? What if, what, if I, what if I don't move in God's time? And what if I miss everything that he wants to give me or show me or teach me or whatever because I, I wasn't trusting and calling on him because I moved too quick or I moved too slow? That's, that's the dilemma. Not just the ministry, but that's the dilemma that each of us can face when we're struggling with, with things in our life. What if you stop short of this amazing blessing that God has because you stop calling on his name? And so I encourage you tonight, don't miss out. Don't, he, he, he's got you here for a purpose. You've heard me say before, if you're still breathing, God still has a purpose for you. And you say, man, this is no life, though. The life I'm living right now, this pain, this struggle, these issues, this stuff, what I'm doing, this is not living. Again, that's exactly where the psalmist was. I'm in the grave. God, you've put me here. I'm dealing with all these things. But remember what he was doing. He's crying out to God. Keep crying out to God. Keep calling on God. There's a purpose through it. I promise you that. I can't necessarily tell you what the purpose is other than God's desire is to bring him glory and uh, to accomplish some purpose uh, to, in his plan. So keep crying, crying out to the Lord uh, in that. If the ushers will come now, I'm going to spend some time in group prayer. And uh, after we do this, uh, maybe you're one that is overwhelmed in, in despair, overwhelmed in affliction, and after we do group prayer, you can come to the altar tonight and uh, maybe just lay it before the Lord. Say, God, I'm going to call on you again. I need your help.
As they pass this out, you're going to see a couple things um, that we're going to be praying for uh, on top of what we normally pray for. For God's kingdom to come and his will be done in your life, your family, and our nation. States of Massachusetts and Michigan, the leaders, churches, and Christians there. And uh, something else I want to ask you to, uh, to pray for, uh, a couple of things. We uh, pray for the Hendricks family and the Jones family uh, every week, safe travels and, and favor, and uh, that changes every now and then. Um, and I'll ask you specifically a couple of things, health related for both of them. Brother Ryan is going through a, a little detox period right now. Uh, he, he's got some health things, and most of you, I think, know that he, he deals with these health things because he's traveled the world and ate everything under the sun. Uh, no, <laughs> no. Um, but he is, he's going through that, so I know they appreciate the specific prayers there. And then Ms. Shauna, uh, dealing with, um, just recently diagnosed with RA, and I don't know how to pronounce that word. What is it? Who can say it? Medical? Sorgens, thank you. Sorgens syndrome, right? So uh, I know many of you already knew that, some of you don't. Um, please keep her in prayer and them in prayer. Uh, the spouses, too, you know, because the spouses, they walk through these things as well. Um, and so I know that they'll appreciate that. And then uh, the Christmas season for it to be fruitful spiritually. Um, we had the uh, apartment outreach this past Thursday night. And we got to, to give the tracks out, as we said this morning, to several different people. Got to witness personally uh, to a couple people. I know other people got to talk to people. So um, we just want to see uh, spiritual fruit come from this Christmas season. And so let's take about five, ten minutes in group prayer. And then we'll open up the altar for individual prayer. Let's pray.